discussing the recent Senate acquittal of former President Donald Trump. Followed by a look at the effects of the deep freeze in Texas this week. And finally, we are committed to bringing you the news, views, and info to go on this episode of The Report Roundtable Discussion. I'm Jorge Flores. I'm Amanda Mendoza. I'm Bree Eastlake. And I'm Tristan Magluner. As you can see, we are continuing to practice social distancing and are going to conduct our episodes via Zoom for the foreseeable future. Although we cannot be together in person, we invite you all to continue to be part of the discussion. Follow us on our Twitter at the report CSUF or on our Titan TV Instagram at Titan TV CSUF to keep in touch with us and view our new content. Starting off with our first story, former President Donald Trump has been acquitted on a charge of incitement of insurrection by the Senate. This concludes his second impeachment trial during his four-year term as president and the fourth overall in American history. Trump was accused of inciting the January 6th riot at the Capitol, which took the lives of five people and has put 221 people behind bars. Although the new security footage of the angry mob was released during the prosecutor's time at the podium, only seven Republicans joined the 50 Democrats in votes to convict, still ultimately falling short of the 67 votes required to convict. For more on the story, we turn to CNN reporter Nadia Romero. In comparison to previous presidential impeachment trials, this one was the shortest, but the most bipartisan. But when you look at the numbers, it all comes down to the same conviction, that President Trump was acquitted just like he was during his first impeachment. The yeas are 57, the nays are 43. Donald Trump's historic Senate impeachment trial is over. Donald John Trump, former president of the United States, is not guilty as charged in the article of impeachment. The charge, incitement of insurrection, stemming from the riot at the Capitol. Seven Republicans and every Democrat found Trump guilty. That's the most bipartisan support for a presidential impeachment conviction in history. But it's still far short of the two-thirds majority required to convict. We have no power to convict and disqualify a former office holder who is now a private citizen. The cowardly group of Republicans who apparently have no options because they were afraid to defend their job. This was the shortest impeachment trial in history, but it still had its surprises, including an 11th hour debate to call witnesses. But in the end, House managers decided not to delay the trial and moved ahead without witnesses. We think that we overwhelmingly proved our case. While the impeachment trial is finished, the case against Donald Trump may not be over. There's no question, none, that President Trump is practically and morally responsible for provoking the events of the day. Now, two White House staffers say that the Biden administration didn't have anything to do with Democrats compromising and not calling witnesses. But the administration will benefit. Now Congress can focus on President Joe Biden's $1.9 trillion COVID relief plan. From Washington, I'm Nadia Romero. So guys, as we can see from the results of the trial, as he mentioned, with only seven Republicans voting to convict former President Donald Trump, despite the many controversies he's faced, he's still holding on to a very loyal group of supporters. Some think he might even want to run for office again in 2024. In response to his acquittal, he said, quote, we have so much work ahead of us and soon we will emerge with a vision for a bright, radiant and limitless American future, end quote. In my opinion, I can see him running again. And as we've seen from his time in office, this man doesn't shy away from the limelight very much. I personally do think his fan base is very loyal to him, but as time passes, I wonder how popular he'll be a few years from now since he doesn't have as much influence online as he once did, ever since he was banned from social media websites such as Twitter and restricted on other social media websites. If he does decide to run again, I wonder how he'll group with his followers and possibly gain more. But I really want to know what you guys think. So do you think that Trump will run again in 2024? And if so, do you think he'll have just as many followers as he does now? What do you think, Bree? I definitely do think that he will be running again in four years, so it wouldn't surprise me. But you know what I also want to talk about is the seven Republican members who did vote to impeach Trump. You know, this was very, very big for them. And, you know, it's possible that they are facing so much backlash that they won't be reelected again. Facing backlash from the state that they represent and across the nation. Senator Pat Toomey is facing being censored because of how he voted. The Washington County Republican Chair Dave Ball said, quote, 
we did not send him there to do the right thing or whatever he said he was doing. We sent him there to represent us and we feel very strongly that he did not represent us, end quote. Now, these members are facing serious backlash and it won't be surprising if they don't get reelected. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if the fear of backlash is the reason why Trump was not impeached in the first place. You know, a lot of these senators, I'm sh sure, thought about what am I going to face if I decide to go against him? Now, as we were talking about, I wouldn't be surprised if he is back in four years. That's what he's saying. Well, you know, I actually agree with you, with you both, because this is an important topic to talk about. First of all, yes, we know that probably he's going to run for re-election in 2024. However, I see something different in the GOP party. I see Mitch McConnell and Mitt Romney having a divider kind of like side of the party. And maybe that's going to make more people to start thinking that there's going to be more candidates, not only Donald Trump for 2024, even though he tries to or he's going to try to get reelected on 2024. I see that if the people and later on the Congress and the Senate, they start thinking about invoking the 14th Amendment, holding him from office, maybe that's going to be the end of Donald Trump for the next years. So I'm hoping that the Republican Party is going to start thinking in different candidates, not only for their party and their ideas, their ideologies, but also for society. The people, they need to see new faces in the future years. What do you think, Tristan? Yeah, Jorge, you know, speaking about the 14th Amendment, to end debates on legislation, you would need a three-fifths majority vote. That's 60 senators. I think if the, the Senate really wanted to uh, impeach Trump or just get him out of office, they would have done the 14th Amendment right away, right after the insurrection. But Mitch McConnell held off until after Biden was elected. And clearly, as a the result, they had 57 senators. They just needed at least three more if they wanted to do the, invoke the 14th Amendment, they should have done that right away after the insurrection even happened. Even though Trump's not in office anymore, his influence is so prominent. Moving on to our next story, Texans are currently facing a major power outage. The unusually low temperatures in Texas caused by a deep freeze sweeping parts of the nation have caused the state's natural gas, coal, wind, and nuclear facilities to go offline. Residents are in shock after living in what is commonly known as the energy powerhouse of America. It was reported on Tuesday, February 16th, that more than 4 million people have been affected. For more on this developing story, we again turn to CNN reporter Nadia Romero. Frustration. Hey, it's exhausting. This feels like, this three days feels like it's been 200 years. And desperation mounting. When we went into the store, they barely had anything. There was barely any food. As millions of Texans are left in the dark. No telling when it's going to come on. And in the cold. So we've just been trying to make it through, stay warm, and just stay in the house. A weekend winter storm brought unusually frigid temperatures to much of the central U.S., straining the infrastructure in the area. Texas Governor Greg Abbott lays much of the blame on ERCOT, the power company servicing large swaths of the state. They showed that they were not reliable. These are experts, these are engineers uh, in, in the power industry. Uh, these aren't bureaucrats or whatever the case may be. These are specialists uh, and government has to rely upon these specialists to be able to deliver in these types of situations. The CEO of ERCOT says the rolling outages actually saved the system from an uncontrolled blackout. It's a cold comfort for customers bracing for yet another drop in temperatures. I am upset, but what can you do? You know, we, I, I really just trust in God to help me. The National Weather Service is forecasting up to a half an inch of ice over the next three days from Texas to Virginia. The good news is that once the weather moves on uh, around Friday, it'll be pleasant outside. Um, the roads will be will be passable. And so folks will be able to to, to at least get out of their homes. And, and, I, and I think that'll be a relief. I'm Nadia Romero reporting. The power outages, I've seen them on the news. It's very heartbreaking to see what's going on in Texas right now. But I believe that this is a situation that could have been prevented decades ago. When you look at the history of the, the powerhouse history of Texas, this goes back to 1935 when President FDR signed the Federal Power Act, which allowed the government to regulate electricity sharing and sales between the states. They created the Eastern Grid and then the Western Grid. But Texas, they don't like being regulated federally. They decide to go their own route creating their own grid called the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, also known as ERCOT. So it's not the time to really point fingers on who's to blame, but ERCOT is getting a lot of a backlash. We've never seen anything like this. They didn't prepare for this. All of their wind turbines, power facilities, they're frozen. And this is something that could have been prevented. But for now, my heart just goes out to all of those that are suffering in Texas today. What do you guys think? Jorge, what are your thoughts? Well, first of all, there are a lot of topics to talk about with this, Tristan. 
First of all, I can talk about the COVID and how like this extra effect has on the victims of the outage. I have some friends right now living in Texas and they are trying to find some essential items, but there's nothing when it comes about going to the market shops. So I'm really worried about them. So imagine just this combination between having COVID, this pandemic, and also the freezing times right now of the winter storms coming to Texas. I think it's like the worst scenario. What I can think of is that at least I'm kind of satisfied and happy that Joe Biden, the president, he approved the Texas emergency declaration. So at least there's some action to take for the next days. What I'm really worried also is that how is this help is gonna come? Is this gonna be like easy for it to come like with the shipments and any kind of help from the federal government? Or are we gonna wait a week for it to come and to help to the state? What do you think guys? I agree, Jorge. Things are really rough for people living in Texas now. My heart really goes out to them. I've heard they've had issues with limited water, food, not having enough gas, law, having to get logs, but they're not being enough. People having to huddle for warmth and even water pipes bursting. And according to CNN, the San Antonio Fire Department has been refilling oxygen tanks since many can't even get any from their vendors. And Tristan, you mentioned there were warnings about this. However, I think that this situation could have been avoided to a certain degree. I don't see how Texas overall could have properly avoided this by if we can look at the how cold temperatures were. What do you think, Bree? I want to talk about Senator Ted Cruz, though. He left the state the other day to go to sunny Cancun, while over 2.6 million of his people continue to live without power and heat. You know, acts like this, it makes it feel like some government officials lack a connection with their people. He's facing huge backlash over what he's doing. Done. And so I'm really curious to see what's going to happen with him in the future. Is he going to apologize? What is he going to say? Because it's highly unacceptable for him to have done this. What comes next is definitely going to be a test to see what they're going to have to do in the future. You know, will they be reelected? What's going to happen to them? So it's definitely something that we're going to have to look for in the future to see what they're going to have to do in order to gain their, pe their people's trust back. But you know what, guys, how about we move into some CSUF news now? On January 25th, the university's office of the president announced the closure of the Irvine Center. The center has offered its services to the South County resident students for almost 10 years and hosted about 180 classes and up to 4,000 students per semester. The reasons cited for the closure were due to the maintenance cost and the economic challenges as a result of the re relocation of classes and faculty will not take place in another South County area, but rather the Cal State Fullerton's campus. In other news, CSUF also announced on February 11th that they're pre preparing for a potential in-person semester in the fall. But whether or not students will have the option to take their classes online is still unknown. Many of the students who benefited greatly from the Irvine Center will say goodbye to the end of an era this summer and prepare for a longer commute to campus. You know, my biggest wonder for these students to prefer to use this Irvine campus. This could make it more difficult to attend classes in person. Fullerton should make our classes either in person or you can have the option to do things online as well. It would make things easier for these students who possibly will have this hard time make it, making it to campus. I don't think the pandemic was the main reason for the closing of the campus, but I'm sure it did play a big part. The Daily Titan did report that the university found little to no use for the building during virtual instructions. And as I said earlier, it cost, costed a lot to maintain. Also with the millions of dollars that Fullerton stated it lost, it's not very surprising that they made this decision. But what are you guys thinking? Did the school do the right thing or Will this make it more difficult for the future? Bree, I think this is going to make it much more difficult for some people in the future because not everyone attends a CSUF main campus and some rely on the Irvine campus, like you mentioned, especially when going to the Fullerton campus wasn't convenient. And they also have convenient resources such as the Irvine Career Center, disability support services, psychology counseling, tutoring, and more. So honestly, I hope that everything goes well with the students that attend the center who may not be able to go back to the main campus if classes are in person again. I think what their decision, it's going to pose a lot of complications for the future, but canceling Irvine's campus and now relocating all those students back to the main campus, it's going to pose a lot of complications. And with the consideration of having in-person classes for this fall semester, you're essentially going to put 4,000 more people on the campus. Okay, that's going to be more stress on parking, that could even lead to increase in parking uh, permit passes. You know, they just made the new structure, but right now it's currently not being used. So it poses a lot of different complications that Cal State Fortune is going to have to deal with. And I'm not exactly sure how that's going to pan out. Totally. Now, 
guys, before we move to, to the next story, I want to say this. And there is a cost behind the scenes of this transition from everybody going to, to CSUF at Fullerton. And some research is telling us that the city of Irvine and even the Irvine company, they're planning to convert this as a property into housing. There are some controversies selling that maybe it's going to be a commercial area. So personally, I completely disagree with this idea because we're talking about education. And some of the people, they were quoting students that it was kind of like a liberal arts college. They were giving that kind of vibe. Now, there's nothing, at least for the next semester. So I completely disagree with this. And hopefully, we can think in the future that education is more important just than business. Moving into our next story, we need to say that we have our Black History Month. So Thailand's all month long, we are going to feature stories that celebrate the amazing achievements and accomplishments made by Black people. This week, we are highlighting the new film Judas and the Black Messiah and some of the amazing artists behind it. The film's director, Shaka King, is being praised for creating an earnest retelling of the Black Panthers, who were created by, and led by activist Fred Hampton. Played by Daniel Kaluuya, his fiance, Akua and Jerry, played by Dominic Fishback, and FBI informant William O'Neill, played by Lakeith Stanfield. In the 50 years since Hampton was assassinated, few, if any major Hollywood films, have depicted the history of revolutionary group this is the only King's second film which came to life with the help of producer friends like Ryan Coogler, who directed Creed and Black Panther. Artists like King and Coogler are marking their place in Hollywood history, changing the way Black people are portrayed forever. Guys, such an interesting topic. First of all, because you can see how the portrayal of Black community is so different from other films like Forrest Gump. So I want to know your opinions in this. In my perspective, I think like now these films filmed and directed by Black people, they're going to really portray what the real community was going through in those past times. So I want to know your opinion. What are the differences between these films? And what do you think about the effects of having these films now mainstream as blockbuster films? What do you guys think? Well, Jorge, I think these stories about the Black Panthers and other Black films becoming mainstream shows that there is a demand for these stories to be told, not from the lens of a non-Black person, but for a vast audience. Like looking back, the Black Panthers were seen as a joke in the media and not taken very seriously. And one example I can think of is from Forrest Gump, where a member of the Black Panthers is seen as an overly, as seen as overly aggressive, is kind of played as a joke. And now seeing the film, Judas and the Black Messiah, wants to portray the Black Panthers as a more grounded people makes me want to learn more and see the film. So I'm excited to see how this film will turn out. Yeah, guys, Black history is American history. And I think this new film by Shaka King and Judas and the Black Messiah is the uh, embodiment of that idea. They're telling stories about the real Black Panthers. Fred Hampton, the main character in the movie portrayed by Dan Kaluuya, was age 21, a 21 year old who's doing such ambitious, ambitious uh things in the community, social programs, making free meals for the local children, um, and having a multicultural movement in the Rainbow Coalition to fight police brutality. All these stories have not really been told in mainstream media until now. And I'm excited to see more Black films because it's American history. It's essential to know these things. Growing up, kids didn't learn about this in history. This is definitely going to continue to get the ball rolling to tell everybody's history, not just a select few. So I'm really looking forward to the film as well. Guys, and with that, that's all the time we have today on the Report Roundtable discussion. Have a safe week, everyone, and stay tuned for more news, views, and info to go. I'm Jorge Flores. I'm Bree Eastlick. I'm Tristan Aglunog. And I'm Amanda Mendoza. As always, stay fresh, Fullerton. Fullerton.